Welcome, everyone. I'm Jesse Mogul, and thank you for tuning in to the American Contingency Podcast. Here at AMCON, we are a united nationwide community of dedicated Americans ready to face any challenge that comes our way. Our mission is to inform you by equipping you with the knowledge and training you need to prepare for any man-made or natural disaster. Through active participation in our AMCON community, you'll have the opportunity to grow by learning from others' experiences and sharing your own. Together, we build resilience and strength through shared knowledge and mutual support. And if that intro wasn't more apropos to what we're going to be discussing today, I don't know what is, because whenever I talk about resiliency, we often want to frame it around what preparation items that we have in place and where's our go bag and, and have we thought about mobility and evacuation routes with our family and practice these things. Well, today's guest on the podcast is going to be bringing in a lot of mental resiliency. And for those of you who've been listening to the show for a long period of time, you'll know that I do a lot of life coaching, addiction recovery coaching, and I'm also also getting a master's in psychology and therefore mental resiliency is extremely important to me and I bring these topics up very frequently whole episodes dedicated to them in fact and then Mr. Chad Davis comes out of left field mm -hmm. and introduces himself to me and I'm like my goodness this is the guy who's running the mental resiliency page on the Amcon membership site and who better to come in and discuss mental resiliency and how we can utilize that in our preparation because it's not just about having food and water and shelter and warmth it's how our mind is guiding us through some of these uh, disaster scenarios that we are seeking to prepare for. Uh, but once we get there, are we mentally tough? Are we ready for those? So Chad Davis has a dual diagnosis. Uh, he's a dual diagnosis therapist. Let me spit that out 10 times fast. He does addiction and mental health, which is right up my alley. I've got a whole podcast called From Sobriety to Recovery. I do outside of the MCON universe. And he's the primary facilitator for the mental resiliency page, living in East Tennessee. So he's part of my Southeast cohort. Chad, it is a pleasure to have you on the show. I appreciate it, and I'm, I'm glad to be here. Hopefully, uh, can shed some light on things. Well, already, before we even hit record on the microphone, so many cool topics came up, and I really just want to dive into what you do with the mental resiliency page right out the bat, because we both agree that uh, working with the mind and making sure that the mind is just as prepared as the body and all of our supplies, um, really, it, it really becomes this, this almost like trifecta of preparation. Uh, just explain to um, the listeners what mental resiliency means to you and why it's so important for you that you actually are the primary facilitator of it on our membership site. So um, as it uh, shows on the page, like the mind is the main tool. Everything else is an accessory. Um, as we were saying just before we started, most people know in the fitness field, right? Sports that if you're going to be successful, it's at least 50% mind. And so you spend an hour in the gym, you spend an hour practicing on the field. The question is, is where did you spend your hour training your mind? If it's at least 50%, then you should be giving it just as much as you do in the gym or, or, you know, shooting or prepping or, or stacking or making sure your gears in, in line, you should be spending an equal amount of time training your mind as well. When you discuss the training of the mind, let's get into that aspect. Cause I know for both of us, this is important to us and we both, you know, guide clients and do a lot of work in this field, but for people who aren't as familiar with mental resiliency and training of the mind, they might be confused as to what that even means. Cause I look, if I say go to the gym and work out, pick up heavier things than you're used to keep doing that consistent, consistently eat a, a healthy amount of good foods and drink a healthy amount of water and your body will operate better than it currently is <laughs> versus <laughs> mental training, which might seem confusing to people because they don't know how to picture that in their minds, let alone activate that activity in their own lives. Sure. So um, a good baseline is you've got to first understand that 90 to 95% of your day is subconscious or unconscious. You're not actually thinking about what you're doing, right? Which is great for like the memory repetition, like shooting, um, that's why you practice survival skills over and over again or emergency drills over and over again. So when the emergency happens or when you're shooting, you're literally going by muscle memory. The issue is, is if you want to change, if you want to get better, you must do the same 
concept. You must get into what's called metacognition, which is literally thinking about what you're thinking about. And we do that. I have all my patients do it through two very basic ways. One is you have to increase your own attention and focus. You can do that by simply counting your breaths. As simple as it sounds, right here, right now, breathe in, breathe out, in your head, there's one. Breathe in, breathe out, in your head, there's two. What you will find is you'll get to seven or 17 and you'll forget that you were even counting. You'll forget what number you're on. You'll start thinking about whatever because that's what the brain does. The average attention span is only six to eight seconds long. So part of mental training is literally learning how to think about what you want to think about despite the environment, not because of the environment. The other is to redirect your attention back to it. So you can take uh, something as basic as a trinket of any sort. There, it's actually called a candle or flower meditation, but you can use any item, put it in front of you, really pay attention to it. Like, like look at it like you were going to draw it when you close your eyes. Close your eyes, hold that image into your head for as long as you can. And what's going to happen is the same thing. Your mind's going to start thinking about, hey, is the coffee pot on? What am I going to do for dinner? Do I need to change the laundry? Like whatever. Your, your, your mind is going to get pulled in a different direction. Open your eyes, bring your attention back to that item. And that is being able to redirect your thinking despite the environment. I'm taking some pretty cool notes on this to make sure that we go back and cover some of the things that you just mentioned. When we talk about um, our 12 categories, one of them is situational awareness. Mm -hmm. And I think it gets lost on people that, you know, situational awareness is being able to see the entire field in front of you and also anticipate things that are could, could potentially come out of left field that right. you have no idea might happen. And, you know, I picture um, all the trips I've made to major cities and I've lived in them, visited them, and you can find yourself in Times Square and there's a lot going on and being able to see the things that could potentially be a problem and also be able to focus in on who you're hanging out with and the directions to get to the, the place that you're going can be a lot for the mind. And it sounds like by counting breaths or being able to picture something in your in your mind close your eyes wait till the pictures right the untethered soul by michael singer talks about just a constant barrage of voices and pictures mm -hmm. coming into our heads at all times being able to refocus back on what is in front of you uh, will ultimately help you with situational awareness and just your overall preparation for times when the noises are so loud you barely can understand what's going on around you 100 percent, because that's the like that's the key is we've been conditioned which is human there's nothing wrong with it there's you're, nobody's lacking it's how the brain works it's impossible for the brain to process every piece of information around us each little thing at a time so we recognize patterns right schema patterns of recognition and attached to each one of those schema and this is the tricky part is there is a narrative and an emotion that's linked to each trigger if you will so if you see something you're going to automatically start reacting to it a certain way you're automatically going to start thinking about it a certain way which means that in a survival situation in a high pressure situation you're going to react how you've always reacted in the past so if you don't want to do that you have to train a different emotional reaction and a different inner narrative to make that happen and the only way to do that is to get centered, to get clear, to become de-stressed, which we can talk about as well if you want, and then put your thoughts where you want, keep your attention and focus there where you want it, despite what's going on around you. Or you're just gonna fall into the default network mode and you're gonna do what you've always done. Interesting that you bring up the the patterns of recognition. You know, you've got the the reticular activating system. You've got confirmation bias. So if your brain naturally gets into a high pressure situation, and your first inclination is to snap at those around you or start running around the house just willy nilly grabbing mm -hmm. things, then all of a sudden a tornado is coming and barreling down in your neighborhood, and somebody's like, "Oh, well, that will be when I'll act calm because that's whenever I told myself be calm and grab all the things that I need before the house." 
else gets sucked away like, you know, uh, Auntie Anne and, and Wizard of Oz. But that's not the case based off of what you're saying is that you actually are going to go back like muscle memory, like you know, the way we shoot a gun or pull out a knife. It's going to be the same way with our mental memory. We're going to go back to those same behaviors that we've always done. Yes, especially in high stress, because in high stress, your brain is not programmed to be creative or critical thinking. Right. Like you are not designed to be like, hmm, I wonder if this tiger's eaten today. Like that's not how you're wired. You're wired to either fight that tiger or run from that tiger. So if you want to be, and that's what the whole stress inoculation is, and you know, a whole nother conversation, but you have to program your hardwiring different if you want to react differently. If you get into any of the, you know, the high-end stuff, special forces of any type, like that's why they do so much about the mind. That's why they train in high stress situations, is so when high stress hits. It's not such an abnormal thing and they can actually critically think they can still like that's why, you know, high stress be like, what's nine plus nine? And they're like, ah, your brain isn't designed to do even just basic math and high stress until you train it differently. How interesting that your brain would it, it does get locked in on no we're in survival mode now mm -hmm. uh, our heart rates up our adrenaline's flowing and as you were describing that a picture of it a of a winter olympian who does the cross-country skiing and then has mm -hmm. to stop on a dime pull out their gun and then shoot a target a football field away mm -hmm. comes to mind the amount of, of breath work and i think we yeah. forget because we breathe every so unconsciously that it's actually focusing in on the breath that can bring a lot of that focus and that calmness that you're seeking when your adrenaline is running so high. Oh, hundred percent. And that's, um, again, as I tell all my patients, look, breath work and mindfulness hasn't been around for more than 5,000 years because it doesn't work. <laughs> like, <laughs> like there's every ancient civilization out there talked about the importance of the breath and we just take it for granted and um, we shouldn't. When you mentioned stress inoculation, we talk a lot, you know, about being prepared and, and feeling informed and equipped and, and having this training and part of this mental resiliency that you discuss so much on the members site on under that page is about understanding what the mind is doing here. Dive into that stress inoculation a little bit and, and give the listeners an understanding of what you meant by that. So your body, anytime there's a stretch stressful situation, your body is going to automatically, subconsciously, unconsciously react to it. Like you start reacting to the situation before you're aware of the fact that you're reacting to the situation. Your heart rate's gonna increase, um, adrenaline, cortisol can hit your, your bloodstream, uh, respiratory's gonna change, you're gonna start breathing quicker, more shallow. So, which is fine, right? Like that's the natural response and that happens. Like that's why, you know, operators move. Right? They, they don't want to get the lead feet. Um, you need to be aware of that and you need to be able to regulate your own system, which is again, part of the mental resilience of, you know, what are you going to do if the feces strikes strikes the rotating oscillator, right? Like, how are you actually going to deal with that? How are you going to regulate your system back down so you can be functional? Um, part of stress inoculation is not freaking out that you're freaking out. Like, that's why panic attacks happen, right? Like in uh, in the mental health field, you, you start thinking things that are stressful, then you start feeling stress. So therefore you start thinking more stressful because you're feeling stressed and that just increases the feeling of stress which then perpetuates the whole thinking of stress. So just being able to say, hey, I'm okay, and I know these things can help self-regulate my own emotional response, because we're all human. You're going to respond. The high-end operators respond to some level still, right? Like if they're sitting there on the couch watching TV and a car comes through their living room, they're still going to respond like a human. It's just their refractory period, their emotional response time is going to be much less. They're going to be able to dial it back in. They're going to be able to say, hey, this is what I need to do next. You know, they're going to snap back out of it, go for their med pack, like whatever the case may be, and deal with the situation because they've learned how to dial their own emotional reaction back in. And that's 
in mental health and mental resilience. That's the goal that I try to help people with is you're a human being, you're going to respond, try to get that emotional response to as short a time as possible. It really is like shortening that fuse and saying, but why is there even a fuse? And so now my brain is moving towards the uh, anxiety and I have my own way of framing anxiety that we're really just future pacing about things that could potentially happen. Right. And then we get anxiety attacks or people are like, I, I stay up all night just being worried about this, these infinite amount of variables that could go mm -hmm. sideways. Mm -hmm. When you are working with your clients or posting material over in the MCOM page under for mental resiliency, I'm just going to keep repeating that you do that. So people go there and read <laughs> <laughs> sure. I, I have, I'm a firm believer that the that the, this goldfish uh, attention span that we have uh, necessitates my constant repetition of things I want people to remember. Yes. So uh, Chad writes for the mental resiliency page on the American Contingency <laughs> membership site. In case you guys haven't remembered that yet, to talk a little bit about anxiety and what you notice with people who do. We got a lot of members who are super worried about the politics or the economy and all these things that could possibly happen and may or may not but it's really affecting their current life now and causing them not to really be able to live life to the fullest. Oh, hundred percent. So um, I try to make light of all mental work is especially in the, in the mental health field um, because it's all your inner narrative, right? Like whether it's depression or anxiety or anger, it is all self perceptual because something that might stress you, I might get excited about. Like some people freak out about skydiving. I love skydiving. Some people might freak out about motorcycle racing. I love to be on a bike, right? Like, so your experience is just that. It's your experience, it's perceptual, it's biased based on your old beliefs, right? Like future or past hurts inform future fears. Right. Like, so the only reason you're even stressing about it is because something in your life you either directly experienced or saw somebody else experience or somebody's told you this is a threat. So now you're seeing this previous threat and you're like, oh, my God, this threat might be out in the future. But as I tell patients, you're literally worrying about a hypothetical cartoon that will probably never come to pass. And that's the thing. It is truly like you can't reach into your pocket and hand me anger. You can't reach into your pocket and hand me anxiety. It is real in the sense that you are having a real emotional response. But it's your emotional response based on your inner narratives. You're basically creating a news report about what's going on in the world and then you're getting upset about the news report that you're creating. And that goes back to the mental resilience side of it is you have to learn how to get control of that news report. You can be aware of a potential threat without having a news report that's sending you into fight or flight. Great that you bring that up because I, I know that in society, I don't know how about many American contingency members are dedicated to watching these 24 hour news cycles play out on the TV mm -hmm. constantly. But I do know that it's happening in society and I feel like it's, it's putting these images, it's putting these concerns and all into their head. And then people get it in there and they just keep repeating it to themselves over and over and over again. And they get themselves in such a high state of, of anxiety fluctuations that it's, it's hard for them to calm down because they've done nothing but just really pour poison over their brain mm -hmm. that is if you just rewind just a second to what we were saying just a few minutes ago about the human brain does not critically think and stress <laughs> if you're stressing about the news report it's basically impossible to fact check it because you're stressing about the news report which is ultimately what leads so many people to have this divisive nature. I don't know how often you notice it within your own clients, but certainly uh, just being in the world that I'm in, I'll notice that people on the left, right, however people would want to frame it, Republican, Democrat, what ultimately, but on my side, what I feel like ends up happening is they end up future pacing what the other party might do mm -hmm. if they were in power. So mm -hmm. people who are anti-Trump or anti-Biden are more concerned with what might happen, not necessarily what actually is happening. And then of course the report 
reporting is so skewed, you don't really know if you're finding out anything that's correct. And then you ultimately get yourself in this constant state of stress, but there's no way to really alleviate it because you've created it in your mind through all these pictures. So the only way that it can be stopped is with your own mental resiliency. And if you're not trained in that aspect, you might be missing out on an opportunity to calm yourself down. 100%, right? You're just going to go along for the ride. And that's uh, Victor Frankl, right? Like the his quote about the the last of human freedoms is to choose one's attitude in any given circumstance, right? And that's the key is the difference between a growth mindset, somebody that's uh, uh, mentally strong versus the victim mindset that's, you know, just a victim to circumstances. Be like, well, what if this happens? Be like, okay, well, it happens. One, I can't control it if it's on a world revolving thing anyway. And I've done things to help mitigate if it does happen, right? Like that's what I think Amcon's all about is you can't stop a tornado, right? You can't redirect a tidal wave. Like if there's a massive fire, like it's heading your way and like the firefighters are going to try to mitigate it. But what if it does roll over your house? Well, then if you create some type of contingency plan, then you can change the narrative in your head to be like, okay, well, yes, you know, a fire would suck, but I have things in place if there is a fire, uh, you know, civil unrest is going to change how we, you know, navigate life. But if you have some stuff prepared and you've mentally thought about it in a, okay, well, what would I actually do? Not, oh my God, oh my God, I'm going to be a victim to this. The story in your head is very, very, very different. I mean, you nailed it by throwing the word contingency, which is how I believe Mike Glover came up with the American contingency to begin with. It's it's having plans in place. And, you know, Tom's been on the show and he'll say, you know, planning is priceless, but plans are worthless. I mean, Mike Tyson likes to say, as soon as you get punched in the nose, all, <laughs> all game plans go out the window. But at the same time, it is, and I think a special forces, and obviously we've got many of them in American contingency, the amount of times they practice something over and over and over again. It's not just for the muscle memory of how they're going to pull their gun out and focus it on their target, but also how they're going to calm their breath down, how they're not going to be so worried about the bombs going off all over the place that they are. This is my moment right here. And this is what matters. And mm -hmm. when a fire is coming and a hurricane and a tornado and all of these things, this is when we want to be at our, our, our strongest mentally. And you mentioned growth mindset. You mentioned uh, disempowerment. You mentioned so many things I talk about. What is it like to be somebody in the MCON community who informs people about this stuff? And what kind of responses are you getting within the community about the material that you post? Um, so everybody that uh, replies, they're they're all all for it, and they're like, "This is on point. This is great." And they, you know, they normally provide examples about you know situations in their own life or whatever. Where, man, you know, this is I know exactly what you're saying. Like I went through this, or man, yeah, if I had done this, this probably would have been better, or or, or whatever the case. And the information is just that. It's like, um, like we were talking beforehand. Like people have spent hours and hours and hours in the gym or hours and hours and hours on the trail or, you know, years or decades, even gathering gear. But like, you know, the, the, the idea of it takes 10,000 hours to, to perfect your craft, be like, where is your 10,000 hours on the mind? Like, that's what I'm constantly trying to pound into people is we think because we're thinking some idea that we're thinking that we're working on our thoughts, but like I said, 90 to 95% of those are subconscious or unconscious and 80% of those are the same ones as yesterday. So we're not really moving forward unless you're consciously moving forward. Just like, you know, people that continue to practice shooting. This is an example that I give even my, my patients. I'm like I can shoot pretty well, but I still practice it, whether it's in live fire or drive fire. Why? Because I want to maintain it. It's the same thing with the mind. Even if you mastered it, you still practice it. Yeah. <laughs> so like unless you're levitating or like pushing your hands into cave walls like some ancient yogis or whatever, like you're still going to be practicing the mental side of things, even if you're amazing. So if you're not at that level, then you should be, in my opinion, you should be spending even more time. Just like if you were, you know, training for a marathon, well, as you're getting closer, you're going to be spending more time in the gym. You're going to be spending more time on the track. You're going to be spending more time getting there. So 
again, in my opinion, you should be doing the same thing on the mind. Be like, man, I got a lot of way to go, which is fine. But that just means that every day, just like if you're going to the gym every day or if you're eating healthy every day, like you should be making it a priority to get some of that mental something in, whether it's mindfulness or breath work or meditation or the visualizations, mental games, like anything that's truly making you think about what you're thinking about and you're doing it on purpose. When you were saying that, it, a picture of Michael Phelps popped into my head. Mm. I, re I remember how much he would talk about the mental aspect of it and training his breath and maintaining focus. And he won one of those gold medals in Beijing by, I think, one one thousandth of a second. Yeah. And he was so focused on his form. And it was, yeah, he was eating 20,000 calories a day. Was he swimming, you know, umpteen amount of miles in a pool every single day? Yeah, physically, dude was on point. He looked like he was cut out of marble by a, a Greek, you know, mm -hmm. person who would do that stuff. Uh, carver guy but I'm, I'm totally lost my train of thought trying to figure out what they would call one of those people who carve people out of marble but i remember him saying my mental aspect is so important that i train that just as much when we think about the training that we offer people over in american contingency one of the primary reasons i really love to highlight this is that you can watch a million videos on YouTube, but it doesn't necessarily give you uh, opportunity to connect through the feed directly with members who are, you know, experts. And I would definitely say you are up there as an expert level on this material. What's it like for you to be able to help people train themselves mentally and be able to connect through the feed so that they know that they have a direct connection with you when you're both on the, the membership site? So that's um, one of the new things that I've, I've thrown out there. Um, we're talking about uh, how much free time we both have. Uh, one of the things I've been considering though is doing like a live Zoom just for whoever would like to join in on a, on a specific time, on a specific day. So it's preset, you can plan for it. Um, Cause that's, I think that's where, you know the rubber really meets the road. Uh, it, is, it is one thing to watch the videos, but then applying it, um, asking little questions that might not have been explained in the video, um, getting information that's outside of the video. Like, you know, I've, I've read 50 textbooks on the mind and, and counseling. Like there's a whole lot more information that is, that is available and, and pertaining to whatever topic it is about the mind. Um, I think that's part of why it's such a good resource yeah, uh, everybody on their page is, like you said, is an expert in what they're doing. So you can get the information off of that, but it is building that like, okay, well, this answers this situation for this scenario, but like, what about this? Or how do I expand on that? Or, or okay, so I've started some mindfulness, like what's next? How do I, how do I go to the next thing? I think that's, uh, I think that's the baseline for the the program itself is it's a vast not just not just a vast amount of information but also the ability to continue to grow on that information which I think is just as important. That's a great point to make cuz there's an umpteen amount of it. There's all the human information we've ever wanted is at our fingertips because of the internet. Mm -hmm. So it can be information overload. And so it's like disseminating what is the information I actually need right now. Um, you know, there's there's the the baseline. This is the good information. Here's some better information. Here's the best information. And let's find where the person's at yes. and, and guide them along, not trying to throw expert material right at them whenever they're still just trying to learn how to count their breaths. Yes. Yeah, hundred percent. And that's the, again, just like that, be like, yeah, we, I can Google anything, but does it mean that that's where I need to start? Is that the best information for me? Um, like going into, uh, you know, as a personal trainer for 20 years, I can write anybody a routine in my sleep, but it's not necessarily your routine. I don't know what your recovery is yet. I haven't seen you do this routine yet. I don't know what your muscle endurance is yet. I don't know what your true, true strength is yet. I'm literally just writing a routine based on this routine can help most people achieve what you're saying your goals should be. But it's just a start. Like we need to tweak that routine immensely over the beginning. And then as you get stronger, as you're, endurance grows like we've got to adjust that it's the same thing with the mind like as you get better at this and that we need to continue to tweak and continue to grow and like challenge more so you don't become stagnant or plateau with wherever you are 
great with the plateau wherever you are because I think it's really important for everyone to understand regardless of how much you're preparing and practicing and training like there's always it's nothing else but whether you can actually get any better than where you're currently at is subjective to perspective but certainly can you just continue to practice so that it becomes more part of that mental and muscle memory that we talk about that's imperative to feeling that calmness that you desire whenever the fecal matter is hitting the oscillating <laughs> projectile yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's all when about, you go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, yeah, it's all all about the mind, man. The again, as I, as I put on the page, like the mind is the weapon. Everything else is uh, an accessory. We put a lot of attention towards the informing, right? We want to bring people information. We want to equip them with the tools to help them thrive and not just survive. We want to train people so that they have this resiliency, this muscle and mental memory. And obviously we want people to connect through the website and through in-person meetings in order to get to know one another better and to know that this is this material is important. And this is why we all get together to train on it. You literally are informing, equipping, training and connecting people on a regular basis basis how are you seeing american contingency be such an important aspect in your evolution in your own life uh, and then that in the lives of your family so it is a it is a miniature google search <laughs> uh, amcon has already filtered through the million different hits on how do i can um, what, what is even the basics of, of planting, right? Like it's already, it's already gathered the pertinent information to be accessible. Um, I wish, uh, as we were talking about beforehand, I wish I had more time in the day, um, to do all the things I want to do, uh, my stack of books to be able to spend more time on the motorcycle, um, to maybe get even a little more sleep than I do. Um, and Amcon's the same way. Like I'll, I'll get on there one night and I'll spend an hour or two, uh, you know, going over the ham radio information or the bug out information. Um, cause there's always something new. There's always, no matter how much you think, you know, there always seems to be something else. I mean, I just said a minute ago, like I've literally read over 50 textbooks on, on counseling and psychology or therapy or neuroscience. And I'm still learning new stuff about the brain. I'm like, I'm not sure when, when I'm going to get uh, tapped out on, on new information. So it's the same thing in, in all of the other aspects, like no matter how much, you know, there's another trick, there's another trade, there's, there's another way there's a new way, there's an old way that you didn't know about. Um, and for myself in helping other people, like having that information is the key because you never know when that one piece of information is gonna be the most beneficial to who's currently in front of you. I love how you framed it out that we really go through the infinite amount of information and we disseminate it down to this is the important aspect. So you don't have to call through 200 YouTube videos and 14 billion mm -hmm. Google results. It's like, no, here it is. We saved you all the effort. We've searched right. it for you. Just read over this, get good at this, and then you're ready to rock and roll. Mm -hmm. Yeah. hundred percent. It's that, that's the, to me, that's one of the most amazing parts is because uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, there's, you know, canning, there might be, you know, a thousand YouTube videos on it, or, you know, um, you know, all of our PT stuff, like, what's a good workout? Well, you can Google it. Maybe it's good, maybe it's not. But these, what's being presented in Amcon are, are tried and true, at least by those members, and those members seem to be doing well. So if it's working for them, perhaps it will also work for you. Now you're bringing modeling into it, which is something I talk a lot about with my clients. Like, let's find someone who's doing it the way we would like to be doing it. Like, who has the success you desire? Let's mm -hmm. model their behaviors. And will it exactly replicate for you? Probably not because, you know, human existence is infinite, but it'll certainly get you on a path. And now we can start to tweak it. Like you said, with those personal fitness programs, we mm -hmm. can tweak it. But at least now we've got something to start from. Yeah, it's like using a bore site, right? It'll get you on paper without spending 50 rounds to to make sure you're at least hitting target to where you can start adjusting the scope, right? 
This has been a fantastic conversation and I could keep you on the microphone for like another two hours, but we both do have lives uh, off of the camera and I would like to be able to give you the opportunity to uh, if imagine that this podcast could be, well, it actually can be listened to by anybody on the planet. So you currently have a microphone that reaches every single human uh, on the planet. What is something you would want them to know about mental resiliency or how Amcon helps people in that regard or what it is that you're providing as a member? Uh, so that people can say, oh, okay, this, this matters and I should be putting attention toward it. My goal um, is to help people become more than just shadows of who they could be. There was a Zen monk that was uh, being interviewed by a group of researchers and they ended with this thought and uh, it echoes what I would want. The main researcher comes up and he's like, so you guys do all of this chanting and meditation and breath work, visualization and, and fasting to become more like Buddha. And the Zen monk says, no, 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 you misunderstand. We do all of these things to help us understand that we already are. And that would be my message is, I don't care if you're struggling with anger or depression or you're just not where you want to be in life, you're the only one that doesn't realize that you can't already be there. You're the one that's in your own way. That's powerful. That's I say that to people all the time. I was like, don't be the first person to reject yourself. 100%. It's see that there's infinite possibilities and yes, confirmation biases and reticular activating systems and all this subconscious stuff. Like I love that you brought up 80% of our thoughts are recycled from the day before. And it's just a constant chatter in our brains. And I love what you're doing uh, over on the mental resiliency page and, and how you're really bringing uh, this topic to the forefront um, because it's not just about physical uh, strength it's not about preparation of all your stuff and you know ready to go bags uh there's also this whole mental because once you get in the car to evacuate or once you've got yourself huddled in the closet while the tornado is barreling through your cul-de-sac um what do your mind doing in these moments that can then help you be more prepared for the aftermath that's coming uh, rather than just feeling like you're, uh, you know, a chicken little, you are actually focused and like, okay, this isn't what we want to have be happening in our lives right now, but it's what's happening. Uh, let's make sure we come out on the other side of it, uh, feeling like we really took care of business. A hundred percent. That's uh, outside of disaster and catastrophe, it's helping you create a life that you don't need a vacation from. Right. There's no more stress. There's no more worries. I've, I've got this. So if there's no tornadoes, there's no civil unrest, there's no tidal wave, there's not a forest fire barreling towards me, then I should be in a pretty good state of mind and living in happiness and joy and love. Yeah. Tom brought up once that we want everybody, it's not just, it's not just disaster scenarios. It's being prepared for any given Tuesday when you have to take, when you have to take a detour to get your kid to school, because I don't, there's some issue in the road and not freaking out and getting angry and letting that whole thing ruin your day when it's, 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 it's 30 seconds to turn left, turn right turn left and now you're back on the road it's not that big of a deal but yet our minds can take us down a path that just destroys the day or the week simply for something not going the way we had hoped it would 100 percent. got to get in control of that news report about your world <laughs> it's not as bad as you're reporting <laughs> <laughs> and it, if you think it is fire the anchor <laughs> right yeah <laughs> stop being our current news start creating your own news <laughs> Chad, this has been amazing. I uh, definitely would love to have you back on the show. I know time awesome. will be what it is in the future, but we will definitely get you back on the microphone because you brought up so many important topics that we've touched upon them. And to have someone else in the American contingency universe who uh, believes so deeply that mental resiliency is imperative to our preparation brings me great joy to have finally had a conversation with you. Yes, it was awesome. Thank you. Thank you again for having me. Absolutely. You will be back. And I hope you all enjoyed that conversation. Again, that is Chad Davis. He's a dual diagnosis therapist with addiction and mental health. Clearly the guy knows his stuff. I hope that you've enjoyed this conversation. If you'd like more information about him over on the member site, he is the primary facilitator for the mental resiliency page. And if you're located in East Tennessee, you actually have him in your own community. So 
you know, kudos to anybody who's had an opportunity to reach out to you, Chad, and, and get some of this firsthand knowledge from uh, right straight from the horse's mouth. <laughs> Thank you again. Absolutely, my friend. All right, my, my fellow listeners and American Contingency members, uh, when you're ready to prepare, grow, and share by building the skills, the network, and the confidence to be prepared for whatever comes next, join us at AmericanContingency.com. We're here when you're ready, and we'll keep the fire going so you can find your way. See you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>